Good afternoon, Hannah. Thank you very much for the opportunity to interview. Thank you for having me. It's lovely to be here. Uh, who, who are you as a person and why are you seeking for this position? So I'm Hannah Barham Brown. I'm a GP registrar. I'm living just outside Selby. Um, I am contesting this position because I was horrified by the comments that Mr. Allett made um, that eventually led to his resignation, which should have come a lot sooner. Um, and I want to ensure that this election and whoever becomes PFCC in the next 48 hours um, really prioritizes ending violence against women and girls. I think we're in a unique position right now to really tackle what is a huge systemic issue and create a template in North Yorkshire that can be shared across the UK. I'm deputy leader of the Women's Equality party and so this is an area that I feel I have a lot of specialist interest in and yeah I'm very excited to hopefully make things better for my community across North Yorkshire and York. Thank you. The public faith in the police has never been lower. At the moment women and girls are feeling unsafe, hate crime is on the rise in York, raising concern about ethnic and other minorities. What are you going to do to help them? So you're right, trust has never been lower in the police. Uh, that wasn't helped by the pr previous PFCC's comments, but also, you know, in the tragic case of Sarah Everard, that crime was committed by a serving police officer at the time. And so we've got to a stage where women in particular, as well as people from different ethnic minorities, disabled people, queer people like me, feel that they can't trust the police. And that's frankly abhorrent. So in terms of what I'm going to do, I think what we need to really prioritise is making sure we hear everyone's voices. Having a PFCC who comes in firstly with a very clear plan. I fundamentally believe, having met and spoken to all the other candidates, that I am the only one who has a proper plan to target violence against women and girls and other minority groups, which I can come in and kick off from Monday morning, which I'm very excited to do, but also to actually ensure that we have diversity in our representation and we're going out, we're meeting people, we're hearing about their experiences. One of the things we hear when hate crimes are reported, when violent crimes against women or domestic abuse are reported is that the process itself is often re-traumatizing. It puts people off coming forward because they're re-traumatized and then they don't get the outcomes they need. Conviction rates are very low. As a result, hate crime is rising. And we know that. We know that hate crime is rising for all minoritized people. So we need to ensure that we're looking at why that is. And one of my big policies is about putting funding into scrutiny panels within the police and actually taking the learnings from them. We have some scrutiny panels already for rape and for domestic violence cases, but I've spoken to people who are on them. They're not well enough resourced and lessons aren't being taken forwards. And until we can actually show that we are learning from the mistakes made previously, then of course we can't expect minoritized people and people that suffer hate crimes to put their faith in us. So that's what we need to rebuild is rebuilding that communication and also showing that we're learning from the mistakes of the past. Thank you. The PFCC has a statutory duty and a mandate to hold police accountable on behalf of the public. It is also responsibility of the PFCC holding chief constable accountable for the officers and staff's performance and assuring that the chief constable properly, properly performs their duties and those of personnel under their direction and control and that an efficient and effective police force is maintained. It is critical to scrutinize, support and challenge the force's performance. What steps will you take to improve current level of of scrutiny, in particular, violence against women and girls, as well as ethnic and other minorities. So I think I've already touched on this a little bit in that I'm really passionate that we need to be properly resourcing scrutiny panels and actually assessing where cases have gone wrong in the past. But I think you make a very important point. One of the big things that the last PFCC, Mr. Alec Clint, 
didn't understand was that he was meant to be a voice for the people holding the police to account. Instead, with his comments regarding Sarah Everard's murder, he victim blamed and he put the pressure back on victims to keep themselves safe, which he should never have done. He fundamentally misunderstood his role there. Now, I come from a political and campaigning background. I've got a long history of holding politicians to account. You know, I'm a trade unionist. I joined the British Medical Association on a picket line. I have absolutely no fear in going in and demanding better resources for my area, but also holding people like the chief constable to account, because I think that is important. I think, you know, one of the other candidates has suggested that this should not be a political role and that it should be somebody with experience in the police. Now, he and I, we have discussed fundamentally disagree on this because I think you need to be completely independent. I would say I'm really well placed because I do have an understanding of public services. I'm an NHS GP. I know the pressure that all public servants are under. I know the ridiculous, outrageous cuts that we've seen to public services across the board under the Conservative government. And I have been shouting out and tackling those for a long time. But I am also independent of the police and I have absolutely no concerns in holding them to account as I have done many times in the past so I think having somebody with that confidence and strength is really important having somebody who is completely independent from the police service is vitally important but I think also we need to make sure that the structures are in place and well resourced enough that we learn from our mistakes to rebuild trust in a service that currently is letting people down okay the lack of visible policing is causing alarm among the community there are concerns about how North Yorkshire Police says preventive response and investigative team will keep York safe. What steps would you take to guarantee that we get our fair share of officers and what will you do with them once we get them? So it's quite interesting. We're hearing a lot of talk about getting more bobbies on the beat. But actually, I think it's far more complicated than that. We need to be supporting them to do their jobs. I always find it quite hilarious that candidates from parties who have been responsible for cuts to policing are the ones saying they're going to get more police on the streets. Where do they think they went in the first place? So yes, having more visible policing is really important, but it's actually, I think, really important to actively build those links with the community. So one of the things I said when I went and spoke to York students last week is that I will be going myself to universities every quarter to meet with them to find out what their issues are with the police, what the issues they're facing locally are, and how we can tackle them. And I'm going to do that myself because... I think it's important to hear it from the horse's mouth. But also I wanna be making sure that we're sending PCSOs and police officers into community organizations and groups to have these discussions with them. So I've said I will be sending officers into the universities every week or every month and an absolute minimum to ensure that we're building those relationships because until you see visible police representation, in organizations, on the streets, and feel that there's somebody you can actually approach, we're not going to see an improvement. Having somebody walking up and down the street in high vis holding a taser is all well and good, but that's not actually going to mean that people feel they can report crimes. So we need to do that relationship building as well as that simple visibility stuff. So it's a, got to be a multifactorial response, I think. Uh, one, one could argue that local residents are dissatisfied with police response, and if they don't receive assistance when they are most in need, there is a major issue to address. What, what are your plans to improve police response to crime? So again, I think this takes a multifaceted approach. So we know that there have been issues with, for example, calling 101. And we know that, you know, I had to call North Yorkshire police the other day when an elderly lady turned up on my doorstep in the early hours, lost and confused. And the dispatch person I spoke to was fantastic, but they ended the call saying, I'm really sorry, we're going to need to put this through to the ambulance service because I don't have a car available and I don't have anyone I can send out to help you. At that stage, I was planning on making her up a bed in my house because I didn't know what else we were going to be able to do. And that's really problematic. So, yes, there is something about how we coordinate work. But I think we need to think about 
why it is we don't have enough coppers. You know, I come from a trade union background and I know that the police officers I've spoken to, the union reps I've spoken to, say that actually people are leaving because they are burnt out. We hear about getting more coppers out on the streets and more officers visible, but actually we're losing them almost as fast as we're gaining them, if not more fast, because we're not looking after them and we're not supporting them. I think a lot of people, when I come in and say, you know, my top priority is to root out misogyny in the police, Yes, that is in order to benefit survivors and victims coming forwards, but it's also to support the staff working in the force. And actually, I think we need to understand the pressures that public servants are under. And that's an understanding that I obviously bring from my NHS work. So I think, yes, we need to get more people visible. We need to make ourselves more approachable, but we need to make sure that we're looking after the staff we have so we keep them because we can't afford to keep retraining and bringing in more officers simply because we're not looking after those we have already. Okay. One of your top priorities, you noted, is to ensure that investigations are trauma-informed and victim-centered. You also promise to provide a specialized assistance to anyone reporting abuse and sexual violence. But how are you going to accomplish that? I'm really glad you asked this because I think this is one of the biggest strengths of my campaign is that I actually have a plan for doing this. Everyone's made preventing violence against women and girls their top priority in this election because of the state of why we're having this election, but I don't think anyone else has a clear plan. So for me, trauma-informed and victim-led approaches are about ensuring that the experience of the victim and any trauma they may have are at the center of everything police do in response. Now, there is no set definition to exactly how this works, and there's a very good reason for that. It's because trauma varies from case to pet case. In the NHS, we talk about having a patient-centred approach. We need to have a victim-centred approach. And that's what I would like to see more of in North Yorkshire. So we need to be, yes, protecting people and preventing crimes, but we also need to be treating victims. So I want to make sure that we're learning all the time by having these scrutiny panels. But also one of my big priority points is going to the Ministry of Justice and the Home Office and demanding additional funding for independent domestic violence and sexual violence advocates who can support people reporting crimes from the word go. Because as I've said, we know the process currently re-traumatizes people. We know that puts people off. We know that people are saying they don't feel they're being believed. They don't feel they're being supported. There are specialists out there trained who can take some of that burden off the police actually and ensure that victims are getting the support they need through the process. We already see that organizations like IDAS who are fantastic and hosted a great hustings the other night, they already have some of these domestic violence and sexual violence advocates but that's something that as commissioner I would be able to support some funding for. So yeah I think that's going to be one of the main things is ensuring that we have a really multidisciplinary multi-agency approach to crime that supports the victim from the word go so that way we can increase increase our conviction rates because at the end of the day that is the important thing it's about making sure that issues like you know rape which has basically been decriminalized in this country we are actually seeing results coming forward because that is what victims and survivors deserve so thank you so what would you say to uh, people from ethnic minority and other groups who are still undecided whether they will vote or people I'm not sure whether they're going to vote on Thursday or to general all the voters. What what is your message for Thursday? So sorry, there's a bit of background noise. I've got a plumber in today. Um, please vote is the most important thing. This this role comes with quite a sizable budget and quite a lot of power. And like it or not, we have one opportunity to get the right person to do this job. And I would suggest voting for me because I am somebody who is coming in with a very clear plan. We're hearing a lot of platitudes in this election, and frankly, it's exhausting and quite frustrating. When you've got a budget of 1,175,000, you blooming well come up with a plan of what you're going to do with it. And that is what I have. I am a queer disabled woman living in North Yorkshire. I know many of the struggles that minoritized groups face. I know that I am scared to hold my girlfriend's hand when I walk down the street. That is the situation we are living in, and that is what I want to change. I'm a GP, I'm embedded in my community. 
I listen to different voices every single day. And for me, I'm approaching this as I would approach any other group of patients. I want to come in. I want to have conversations. Accessibility for me is absolutely centered for everything. And I want to get to know people. I want to get to know different community concerns and be the voice for people who hold the police to account, because that is the first line of the job description. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, William. It's been really lovely to chat to you. Thank you.